Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Sears. I'm a social architect with AWS. I'm the partner organization, and I work with big data partners. Um, we're happy you're here today, and I'm joined today with uh, Daniel Woodlands and Anna Kepler from Viaset, and um, we're going to um, basically discuss optimizing storage on big data workloads, as well as listen to their story of, of big data. So uh, we're going to get started here. So what we call big data incorporates many kind of workloads. We're gonna cover five workloads today. Um, we're gonna go through them pretty fast. So we have Hadoop uh, with Amazon EMR, Data Warehouse with Amazon Redshift, uh, Streaming, Amazon Kinesis, NoSQL, Amazon, uh, Amazon DynamoDB, and Search with uh, Amazon Elasticsearch. So we're actually gonna be focusing on the other versions of these, um, for example, if you wanted to run your own Hadoop or your own like Cloud, Cloud, uh, Cloudera or Hortonworks or MapR, or you did your own data warehouse with Vertica or Teradata, we're gonna focus on those choices today to allow you to figure out or determine the optimal storage you should be using for those workloads. So if you're using um, Amazon services, the advantage of that is that they're managed for you. You don't need to worry about your storage provisioning you don't need to worry about your performance, your throughput, because all that's managed for you. You don't need to worry about patching or anything like that. So you just can use the services, build your applications, do your big data applications, analytics, and, uh, and so on. But if you want to do it yourself, then I'm going to help you at least give you an introduction to think about the different kinds of I.O. patterns you're going to see with these workloads that will then allow you to choose the right kind of storage. So um, with big data, we kind of evolved from uh, with modern Hadoop coming around, you know, uh, late 90s, early 2000s with it was commodity hardware because back then in your data centers you had these large, you know, SAN or, or uh, direct attached storage appliances. The disks were very expensive. The store servers were very expensive. So Hadoop came around with the design of using um, very uh, inexpensive commodity hardware. Uh, making it uh, replicated multiple times for durability. And uh, that way you can save some costs and scale out some large clusters and get your performance around um, uh, move for your big data applications and projects. So it really kind of avoided the network as uh, storage as much as possible because that was expensive. So now with the cloud, it all changes. So um, network storage, which we're gonna talk about today, gives you persistence, it gives you the ability to decouple your compute from your storage. So in the old way, you had to upgrade your hardware to either get more disks or add more capacity beyond a certain point. Um, you also have the ability to do things like snapshots. And um, you also can use things like ephemeral storage in certain use cases. This can be very fast, but it's, it's very temporary storage. Um, and we'll kind of go through that in a few minutes. So to, re to briefly recap our building blocks of storage on AWS, we have our object storage, which is Amazon S3 and Amazon Glacier. We have our file-based storage, which is Amazon EFS. This is more or less like a giant NFS server that scales automatically for you and highly durable. And then we have Amazon, our, our block services with uh, Amazon EF EBS. And the block storage is the raw disks you would see normally like you would on a server. In this case, there will be attached over the network. So let's go ahead and get a little deeper into what EBS is. So block storage, we have two offerings. I mentioned um, EBS and also I mentioned ephemeral storage. So um, the instant store is ephemeral storage. And then we have our EBS uh, volumes that are SSD backed. And we have, these are coming to two flavors, GP2 and IO1 and they're based on um, performance characteristics, throughput in terms of IOPS. And then we have our EBS HDD back volumes, which are our magnetic storage, um, and these volumes come in two flavors, ST1, SC1, based on the overall throughput you need for that storage. So what is um, instance store? Instance store is the actual disks attached to the instance that your, or the, or the hardware, or the servers, that your instance runs on. And this is transient storage, it's non-persistence. Now, if you reboot your instance, you still get access to your data on that storage. However, if you terminate your instance, or if the host has a, has a problem, a failure, 
you will lose that data. So it's meant to be ephemeral and temporary. It's usually very fast because it's directly attached to the server. Um, the data is not replicated by default. There's no additional durability to it. And uh, there's no support for things like snapshots. And it does come in SSD and HDD, um, HDD formats. So how does this compare to EBS? So EBS is our block stored as a service. Um, you get it over, basically, it's over the network storage designed with five nines availability, and you access it via API calls. So you can attach and detach volumes to your instances using API calls, and we'll see some advantage of this shortly in our um, discussion. Um, and the key here is EBS is over the network. So um, EBS is a service. It's not the actual disks themselves. You're not getting physical disks assigned to your instance. You're going to get part of a, a giant pool of capacity available to you that are shared out as volumes that you then attach to your instances. So the volumes on EBS, they persist um, regardless of your instance state. So you can terminate your instance, you can create new ones, and your storage is still available, it's still there. So this allows you to decouple your compute from your storage. Let's say you decide on a certain instance size and your performance is okay, and then your data size gets bigger or you need more, more CPU power, you can detach that storage, get a different instance size, rebuild your, your, your instance, and then attach that storage back and have your data available. So that's a kind of a key thing. Um, and this, it does, you can attach and detach within the same availability zone, a okay, key point here as well. So when you build your applications, you have a durability within AZ, and you can move the, instant, the volumes around to instances within an AZ. And one more animation, here we go. Okay, so, so when you have so many options, it comes down to how do you really choose the right volume type you want to use? So um, we're going to get into specific I.O. patterns shortly. Um, but if you really don't have any preference, GP2 are um, EBS SSD volumes, general purpose volumes. It's probably a really good choice. It has really good or good performance. IOPS up to 10,000 uh, uh, based on that profile and, and your volume size. And um, if the cost is, cost is middle of the road. And so if, you're, if you don't really care, GP2 is a good choice. If you really need um, a lot of high IOPS, then you can go with IO1 volumes. And these can, um, your IOPS are greater than 80,000, or sorry, under 80,000, but more than 10,000, you can actually provision IOPS and guarantee a certain amount of, uh, of performance from these volumes. Now, sometimes you may need to go either higher, higher than that. So on our I3 uh, volumes, these are ephemeral store SSDs, but they're the new NVMe SSDs, and you can get up to 3 million IOPS um, on these particular volumes. The data is not permanent, so if you shut off your instance or something happens to it, you may have to um, re recreate your data, but it's very high performance on the ephemeral storage. And on the other side, we have for um, HDD, back, HDD back volumes, we have our SC1, which is a, a lower throughput, average throughput, um, but it's also lower cost. And so we also have our ST1 volumes, higher average throughput and uh, higher burst throughput, as well as a little more um, performance than you would on, on, on SD1. So you can kind of see the contrast here between SSDs and HDDs, and um, you can make a choice here based on what you need for your particular application and your instance size and type. And also we have ephemeral storage for hard uh, HDD volumes, uh, the D2 instances, for example. Um, this is uh, higher performance in terms of um, throughput, but it's, again, it's ephemeral, and it will, the data, the data is not persistent, so you need to deal with those persistent issues. So if you look at the landscape of big data analytics, um, it was a big move to put, move data onto Amazon S3, which is our super durable storage, 11 nines of durability. And um, if you also map out other uh, analytics applications and moving down the whole, the whole set of workloads we cover here, data warehouse, streaming, and catalog, or indexing, uh, NoSQL databases, uh, and search all fit really well in EC2 instance store or Amazon EBS. Um, there are some, in, some limited uses for Amazon EFS. For example, if you're using grid computing, 
You may need to have some sort of shared file system where EFS could be a good choice. But in, in general, most workloads that you're going to deploy on EC2 are going to be fall into either using Instant Store or EBS. So we're going to dive into Hadoop really quick. Um, so the key thing about Hadoop is that it uses a file system called HDFS. And when it was designed, it was designed with commodity hardware in mind. Um, the disks really weren't very fast. Uh, the network wasn't always very fast as well. So it did everything as sequential I.O. only, and it's a very large block size. And I'm talking about just straight Hadoop itself, HDFS. Um, and so the block sizes for data reads and writes would be either in blocks of 64 megabytes or 120 megabytes or 256, depending on the, how you set up and, and configure your Hadoop cluster. So um, the data is distributed across all nodes in the cluster. Well, it's distributed. Um, and it's, it's basically replicated three times. So you, if you want to have a chunk of data, you're going to have actually two extra copies of it. So that meant your clusters in Hadoop would be t three times bigger than you really would, would need to do if you just did it on a, a local server. But again, because it's, I, it's sequential I.O., Hadoop works really well with, um, whoops, sorry, let me go here. Uh, Hadoop works real well with our, our HD, back, HDD back volumes. Now, you also can do what's called an HCFS, which is Hadoop compatible file system. And this is what we do with Amazon EMR. It is um, you map the API calls from Amazon S3 into the, HD, uh, the HDFS API calls. And as long as you can do that, you can run HDFS on any uh, type of uh, a file system you want to, as long as you have the compatibility. You even can run it on, um, e on Amazon EFS. As I mentioned here, um, EMR uh, with support for uh, S3A and S3N because um, Amazon S3 is, has some eventual consistency issues. So using things like S3A and um, S3N, you can map, and you can also deal with some of those consistency challenges you have. Amazon Athena, which is a presto under the covers, it talks to um, uh, Amazon, basically talks to HDFS through, uh, through the um, HCFS interface. So looking at uh, Amazon S3 as your HDFS, this is if you would launch your EMR cluster, you would likely choose to have your, uh, your HDFS on S3. There are some advantages. You can scale out horizontally without any data distribution, data distribution issues. It just scales and scales and scales. Um, you don't need to have any separate disaster recovery because Amazon S3 has 11 nines of durability. It's going to be far greater. You can do it in any type of data center or do it yourself on EBS. And um, it's also really a really good place for transient clusters, clusters that are running part time. So for example, if you're storing your data in HDFS, your clusters need to be available for the namespace for the data to be available. So they need to run as long as you want that data. If you have it in S3 and you're accessing S3 via HDFS through EM EMRFS, that data can, be, can persist and be available outside of a running Hadoop cluster. But there are also some disadvantages as well. So I mentioned earlier, the um, eventual consistency challenge of S3 is a, is a, is a, is a, is a challenge for um, HDFS. So for example, if you do a, re a rename operation, what it does um, in terms of Hadoop or HDFS, it actually just renames the, the node in the data structure itself for the, for the file system, and you're done. And Amazon S3, it actually has to copy the data to a new file. So it's not an atomic operation, and this has a challenge with the data becoming consist eventually consistent. Um, there are ways of uh, helping that along. You can use things like DynamoDB behind the scenes to keep track of metadata, which is actually what EMRFS does. Um, there's also uh, list operations on large numbers of files, and S3 could be a little problematic. And um, security, the, uh, they're, they're doesn't really support IAM, IAM roles very well, and you're seeing that um, S3A is starting to address some of these security challenges working with Amazon S3 as your store for HDFS. So when, you want, when, when should you use HDFS on EBS? So one of the key things here is if you really want high IOPS and performance, you're going to deploy HD, HDFS on top of an EBS set of volumes. So um, it also depends on your cluster types. If you're going to be running long running clusters then you're, and you're managing your space, name space, then running your data on or you're running HDFS on EBS makes a lot, a lot of sense. Also, if you're running in a distribution like Cloudera or Hortonworks or MapR, then you're likely going to need to leverage those file systems, particularly in MapR, 
to, which will require you to run your, over EBS versus S3. So now that you understand that Hadoop is um, sequential I.O., and you can, optimize how, you can optimize your decision on what type of storage you use uh, for, uh, for this I.O. So you can use Amazon EC2 instance store, a D2 instances, for example, and you can get three gigabits, uh, gigabytes a second throughput. But um, basically with Hadoop, the, the network and the disk really aren't the bottleneck. Usually it's your compute power. So you're actually going to hit your compute ceilings faster than you're going to hit your storage ceilings. So in this case, using Amazon ST1 volumes are probably a better choice overall. Um, you can have a really good burst rate with um, ST1, the, especially if you use with a two terabyte volume size. You also can, also can lower your replication factor from three times to two times using EBS because EBS automatically replicates your data one time within an availability zone. So you get additional durability because of EBS and that way you don't need to have additional copies through the HDFS of that data. And so in here you'll say uh, ST1, ST1s are good choices. Okay, so moving on to data warehouses. Amazon Redshift is our Columnar uh, data warehouse, a managed database that if you wanted to use that, you don't really need to worry about storage. You just pick whether you want a storage um, dense uh, nodes or you want compute dense nodes for your cluster. But if you're going to run Vertica, for example, Vertica is a memory mapped database. It t does all its changes in memory and then flushes those changes into, into disk. So it's actually a really, really good candidate for sequential I.O. Um, SC1, ST1 storage are good options for running a Vertica cluster because they don't really, the cluster doesn't really worry so much about performance of the I.O. If you're looking at, looking at Teradata, Teradata is an also a data warehouse, but it's row oriented and not columnar based. And so it's uh, significantly more random I.O. In this case, um, for random I.O., you're going to want to focus on GP2 or I.O. 1 volumes, or even um, the I2, I3 ephemeral storage instances for the higher performance, if you really want to work on, um, you know, if that's a concern for you. But so for row-based row teradata, it's GP2 or SSD-based storage. And for Vertica, it's a hard disk or HD uh, back, back volumes. So look at NoSQL, we have um, Amazon DynamoDB. We also can look at Cassandra and MongoDB. Now, I'm only gonna give you a brief um, overview of these because we actually, have a many, we actually have a number of sessions this week that are focusing deep into NoSQL on EBS. So and I'll share those with you in a minute. So um, with, uh, where's my slide? Okay. So with NoSQL, um, the I.O. pattern is predominantly random. It's going to be 4K extent. So, so the blocks you're using are 4K in size, much smaller than an HDFS sequential read or write of a 64 uh, megabytes or larger. So the I.O. pattern for NoSQL is a lot of 4K extents that are mapped uh, randomly around the memory and on disk. So it's going to be a random I.O. pattern. Um, so in this case, for random I.O., SSDs excel ver over HDDs. And uh, in this case, uh, eGP2, IL1s are really good um, options for, in a, in a general sense, for NoSQL workloads. Um, and you, you, can, you, can, you can match your profile. So you have, we'll get into a little more into this um, during a, a further discussion, but you can right size, drop to your instance with the network, band, network bandwidth and EBS bandwidth available to get the right performance on there. So um, also you can use snapshots with EBS as well. So again, using uh, GP2 is a, or IL1 is a good choice. You can use instance stores if you want, and there are some challenges with that, particularly if you're using Cassandra. Um, it's, it's not uncommon to use instance, uh, instance store with Cassandra, but when you have to rebuild your cluster, you gotta replay all your data, and you gotta retain more logs to be able to do so, so there's some, a, a, a balance there as well. And in most cases, um, a lot of customers are seeing the advantage of going to GP2 IL1 over using a ephemeral store SSD. So there's a couple sessions here uh, for the deep dive onto uh, NoSQL and EBS um, that are uh, two today and one on Thursday if you want to get deeper into this particular, um, uh, uh, you know, how to, how to optimize for NoSQL on EBS. So now we're going to dive into search. In this case, Splunk is our use case. It could be also Elk or anything else, but the, the patterns are kind of the same thing. 
Here, it's, everything is stored as an index. It's, it's raw data, okay? So you're gonna get the data in, and you're gonna index it, and you're gonna store it into a bunch of buckets. Um, so the buckets are basically divided up on a time range of the incoming data. How hot it is, how cold it is, you know, how, how recent the data is. Your partitioning or your buckets around that. So normally we have um, hot and warm buckets, and this is more recent data, very, either very recent or more recent data. Um, some customers have done 30 days for the hot and warm, some done a week, depending on data growth, data needs. Um, and then you have cold buckets, and cold buckets are, are more for your longer storage, longer term searches. Maybe you don't refresh those as often, maybe you don't need to search those as often. So the profile of those is a little different. So with hot bucket, hot warm, your search is a very, very random I.O. So you don't know where it's gonna be, there's a lot of data coming in, it could be anywhere in those buckets, in those partitions, so you will need a lot of random I.O. for that. If you're doing a search that's bounded with a much longer time frame, it's gonna crawl through all the data it has available. In that case, it's gonna be a lot more, uh, a lot more sequential I.O. on that. For fro we also have a button called frozen. This is more for your archival of your search data that you don't access anymore. And this data, you actually don't search it, but you may roll it into a, a, a cold storage or frozen bucket just to have it for uh, retention for some kind of regulatory or, or whatever reason for that. And uh, so for hot warm, general recommendations are GP2, IO1. Um, and then for cold, it'll be SC1, ST1, because cold's gonna be a lot more sequential IO, therefore the performance and throughput of our HDD back volumes are adequate for, or, or good enough for running cold buckets. And then for frozen, it's a good candidate for Amazon Glacier. Glacier is designed for archival, and so it will store the data in Glacier, and you can have it available for, for whatever retention periods you need to have on that. As I mentioned, uh, sequential I.O. for writes, and then the reads depends on your search, so, as I mentioned earlier. So the next um, discussion for workloads is streaming. Now, we have Amazon Kinesis, which is our managed streaming service for you. It's very easy to use. You don't need to worry about things like storage or really provisioning. You just basically tell how fast you want and how much data you want to get. But if you did want to run your own um, streaming infrastructure, like with, with Apache Kafka, uh, we're going to talk about it here. And so um, Kafka is a pub sub system, pub sub system, where you have um, producers of data and consumers of data. In the middle, you have Kafka um, nodes, brokers, that are going to be basically reading data in and spitting it out. So fundamentally, it's just um, you partition your data based on your topics and, and, and you know, whatever, whatever method you want to break your data up there, but it's gonna write all that data into sequential log files. So you're gonna end up having a large number of log files that are sequential writes throughout your, um, your architecture for how many nodes you have on your cluster. Now, the consumers are gonna fetch chunks of data, and there are, and, and in general, um, the use case is gonna be, uh, you know, ST1 is a good volume, but sequential storage is a very good, good choice for this. And your network is more often your bottleneck than your storage because Kafka can get very, very busy with a lot of producers, a lot of consumers. Network is often gonna be the ceiling you're gonna hit first. There are some cases if you have a lot of high random I.O., for example, if you do a lot of log compaction, or if you have a hard, high number of partitions, then you might wanna use GP2 for those volumes. But for in the general use case, using ST1 is recommended. Okay, so I've covered the five data workloads at a, at a kind of a high level. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Anna and, and uh, Daniel to discuss their story and experiences with, with uh, Viasat. All right, hello guys, how's it going? I'm uh, Daniel Woodlands, oops. Uh, this is Anna Kepler. Uh, we're both here uh, from Viasat and we're uh, excited to be talking to you about the, what we've been doing um, on Amazon and specifically on EBS. So first a little bit about Viasat. Uh, we do a lot of different things, but all those things kind of focus around uh, satellite communications. Uh, we're, we're the first true broadband satellite ISP. Um, we have Guinness Book of World Records, the highest bandwidth satellite in the world uh, that goes into service in a couple of months. Um, we're currently the only Wi-Fi provider that's capable of streaming video to an airplane. So if you've streamed a video on a plane, that's probably us. Uh, we have a lot of um, other uh, military technology um, that I really won't talk about today. A lot of it's secret. 
Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff there as well. Um, for our industry, uh, working as an ISP is naturally conservative, um, but we've really, I think, pushed the, pushing the boundaries of what you can really do in the cloud. Uh, we've been a happy Amazon customer since 2010, and historically, uh, that was physical data centers uh, for our primary, uh, serving our primary customers uh, with AWS for analytics and special use cases, and when you just want to throw up a server real quick. Um, but our, uh, our next-gen uh, ground system um, actually runs majority of the management plane um, and some parts of the control plane um, in AWS. Uh, so we're very, um, we're very vested in AWS, and we really like it. Uh, today, we have over 150 accounts in Amazon, 300 VPCs across seven different regions. Um, we have redundant AWS Direct Connect links on the East Coast and West Coast um, with multiple peering locations. Uh, so we're very plugged into Amazon and doing some cool stuff there. Um, so specifically, our team, uh, we, uh, we're kind of the analytics big data team at the company. And we built a product uh, that we call the Data Bus internally. So the idea of the data bus is that we have a lot of systems uh, in our network that produce what we often call data exhaust. So we might have uh, traffic shapers that enforce policy on our users and ensure that everyone gets a, a, a fair time on the internet. Uh, of course, we're a satellite network, so we have to, at some point, convert that satellite waveform into actual internet packets. Um, and we have to implement the Mac layer two on our network. So there's actual you know, services that implement that. Um, because we're a satellite ISP and we have a large amount of, in, uh, there's a large amount of latency built into uh, that, uh, we have traffic acceleration to try to mask that latency. And then of course, uh, this is a large ISP, there's a ton of networking equipment, um, a ton of management devices, a whole bunch of extra stuff uh, necessary to run a network. And with that data, we obviously we want to use it for uh, monitoring and alerting on that. So uh, the people that develop these tools and operate them uh, want to be able to see how well they are performing, want to be able to see when they fail, get alerts, all that basic stuff. Uh, but when what we really wanted to be able to do with the data bus was connect not only to that use case, but to all the other things that people want to do with that data. So for example, we do security scanning. So we both scan on our network looking for intruders as well as on, the, uh, on our customer's network uh, looking for things like botnets. Um, we, uh, we use this data to do, to do growth projection. So there's some knobs and dials we can turn on our satellite to allocate different bandwidth to different parts of the country. And we use this same data to uh, project our growth over time and look uh, where we should do that. Um, we also pull the data into, um, make it available uh, so that it can be pulled for customer care. So if somebody calls us and ha not having a great time, uh, they can look at the performance of our network, uh, potentially identify an area, uh, a reason for which they are not getting great performance. And the data bus is all about bringing these together and uh, uh, basically building a, what we like to call a data switchboard um, that connects all of these data sources to all of these producers. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the architecture looks like. Um, so Viasat is somewhat unique in that we are largely a vertically integrated company. Uh, we, we build the modems that the users use. Uh, we build a lot of the services that I mentioned are actually developed as applications in-house by our, our organization. And so we build, our team builds client libraries uh, that allow um, others within our organization to plug in a metrics collection into their application. So uh, we have languages in different services, excuse me, we have services in different languages, so we have libraries for Python, for C++, for Java, um, and we have ways of getting generic metrics, plugins for CollectD. Um, some of the things that we are monitoring are third-party devices. These are largely things like network switches, um, so we use pollers in those cases to pull metrics from them. And then we also have a special collection mechanism that we use for collecting data from all of the user terminals. 
The idea here is to reduce the amount of bandwidth used as much as possible. So every bit that we use to manage the, the network is a bit that we can't sell uh, to our customers to actually use on the satellite. So all of those uh, different producers, and there are actually more than this, uh, those all connect to the kind of services that we call the data bus. Um, at the core of that is Apache Kafka, um, and Kafka itself requires Zookeeper for doing quorum. Um, we have our own service that we call the stream service. That's just a, it's a, it just does administration, um, so you can create, delete, update streams, view them, change security policies on them, things like that. Um, and then we also integrate with the uh, Confluent Schema Registry, which helps ensure that, uh, that there's well-structured data between the producers and the consumers. Um, a large part of, like I said, is, is integrating metrics and alerting. So uh, we have a fleet of auto-deployed forwarders that take data that's being produced into these Kafka streams and write them into OpenTSDB for showing uh, monitoring metrics. Um, and we kind of build that in uh, to provide kind of a core value to the people that are producing data to us. Um, but we also send it, this data uh, consumers to all different places. Um, data goes to Grafana, often through OpenTSDB. Um, we send it, uh, we have an internal service that also can uh, uh, generate alerts off that data um, and send them to uh, X Matters or PagerDuty. Um, we, we do analytics on the data. Uh, we pull it into our kind of data warehouse and our data scientists do fun stuff with it. Um, and there are all kinds of, um, there are all kinds of applications that are custom built applications that do other more interesting things with the data. All right, so I, I showed there that our core of our pro product is Apache Kafka, but we kind of, our story of moving to EBS, it really starts in when OpenTSDB, uh, which is itself built on top of a NoSQL database called HBase. So HBase comes from the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, it uses HDFS, the file system, and the fundamental data structure that it provides is the log structured merge tree. Um, LSM is a somewhat complex algorithm, but essentially I like to think of it um, as a distributed write back cache. So every time you write into HBase, you are going to, uh, as Paul mentioned earlier with, I believe it was Vertica, um, you're going to write into memory and then that memory is going to be periodically flushed uh, to disk. So those periodic flushes, there's a lot of reasons that uh, HBase will flush to disk. Uh, it will flush based on uh, time, so just periodically. It will flush based on the amount of uh, per region size. Uh, regions in this case are, are what HBase calls like a partition, a chunk of data, or a bucket is another term for it. Um, it, will base, it will flush based on the total amount of memory that it's using, and it will flush based on its uh, write-ahead log size. Um, effectively, what, the deep, which is, what you can see here is that there are a lot of reasons that, that HBase flushes to disk, um, and those are kind of all operating at the same time. Um, and when we originally deployed this application, uh, we were running on D2 Excels, and we were having an issue where we were getting inconsistent uh, I.O. latency when it came to doing these flushes. So most of the time things would be okay, but sometimes if uh, several of these flushes kind of overlapped at the same time and we got unlucky, well then the uh, I.O. would back up, we wouldn't flush on time, and that would prevent us, that would affect the availability of our system. Uh, we weren't quite sure where this was coming from. We had a theory that it was, we were on D2, so we're shared instances, maybe it's something to do with the, do with that. Um, and we weren't really able to experiment with, uh, with differences. We were kind of stuck deploying a big, uh, making a big change at once. So uh, we decided to try out moving to um, ST1 EBS as our uh, backing data store. Um, and this really enabled us to experiment with different instance sizes um, and to figure out kind of where our bottleneck is. Um, and uh, uh, very quickly, we noticed much more consistent performance um, out, out of EBS. Uh, in our experience, EBS provides us kind of with the pr provisioned amount of I.O. kind of all day, every day, which is exactly what we are looking for. And of course, we were able to quickly experiment with different instance types. We could try, uh, 
we could just stop the instance, change it to a 4XL, and rerun our tests and see how that impacted our performance. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Anna to talk about Kafka. <coughs> so, um, as Daniel mentioned earlier, in the core of our streaming platform that we build, we have uh, Kafka, and it's important for us to design it to achieve a really consistent I.O. throughput. And since we are also operating the system and report to support calls, it's important for us to spend as little amount of time maintaining the system as well. So it is, um, as Paul mentioned earlier, publish subscribe system. We have multiple brokers um, in the core of it, processing the data and replicating the data. We have producers on one side and we have consumers on the other side um, reading this data, forwarding it to our applications. Um, it is designed for the high throughput and all the data on all the brokers needs to be located on a dedicated disk. Uh, even configurations, there are specific configurations, logs.dir, there you could specify there your data is located so Kafka could properly process it and achieve that uh, high throughput. And um, both instance storage and EBS volumes can work well in majority of the cases for Kafka. And originally we did uh, ran our Kafka on D2 extra large systems. However, later uh, with lessons learned from HBase, uh, we decided that we will switch the, our Kafka cluster also to ST1 volumes. And I'll go over, over several use cases where we found that um, what benefits we actually found from doing that. So a little um, more to the core of a Kafka, it is majority of the data process in a sequential I.O. You have producers that append data to log in a sequential matter. There each message associated with a specific offset. You have consumers that um, read from a specific offsets and could be in the middle of your uh, topic, it could be at the, uh, as the data comes in, but most, most of the time they read all this data in a sequential pattern. You start, since it's streaming data, so it's you most of the time interested to process it, and it uh, as it comes in. So the sequential I.O. and multiple consumers, they're independent of each other. So you could have different applications reading the same topic and doing different um, operations on it. So in our case, um, most of our applications, I know Paul mentioned earlier, there's some applications that do a lot of um, comp log compaction. There's a lot of random I.O. In our case, uh, we have 90% uh, of non-burst sequential access. It is 24-7 um, we see the consistent um, throughput from SD1 volumes that we've uh, switched our Kafka to. And it, um, we've obviously a selection of EBS optimized volume, uh, instances, which is important when you go to SD1 volumes. Dif we have different producers and consumers that you could see here, and most of them do have that sequential access, and that's what we see. So some of the special cases that we really saw there, we benefited from switching to SD1 volumes we do sequential access, I.O. throughput really well. However, periodically you do need to do some maintenance on your Kafka. So you have one broker that becomes overloaded of your data. So you need to da move data around to achieve a really good um, overall performance of your system. So the way Kafka does it, um, you design this file with petition reassignments and you move data around in, we generally do it in batches. So we don't, um, we don't interfere with normal data throughput, but we see no normal operations on our brokers. And so when we do that, we see this bursting patterns. And we, when we were running D2 extra large, we often saw that some of our forwarders, um, that producers that write data to Kafka, see some uh, performance degradation. However, while we run these maintenance operations, after switching to ST1, we saw this bursting and still the normal pattern, normal flow of operations has not been interrupted. So we were able to still achieve normal performance on our Kafka while running maintenance and without making any unhappy customers on our side and getting support calls. So there are similar um, bursting patterns that we see um, in some scenarios besides the maintenance. We see network degradation, like for example, the top um, graph here, we saw a little direct connect maintenance of something was happening on, and we saw some data drops, and as soon as the data, uh, network came back up, a lot of our Flume collectors that cache this data while the network is down, start flooding the brokers with lots of data, and 
we didn't drop any data. Everything's been written really well. We, like our instances, were able to achieve um, high bursts and um, process all the data. We went to normal operations within um, a couple of hours. A similar situation we see with our stream processing jobs. Some of our streams are really heavy on data, and we use a lot of Spark processing. And jobs do go down. There are some health checks that we have on it, and sometimes it needs to get restarted. And the um, great thing about Kafka, when your job restarts, uh, you could uh, pick up the, from the point, from the offset, that you stop processing it and keep carrying on and process your data. But you need to catch up to the current point of uh, where your data is currently in because your producers kept writing your data while your job was down. So we see this um, job trying to catch up and write, um, so to go a little bit more why we see the high input, um, sorry, high RX traffic on our Kafka is, so our Spark jobs process the data, they do something with it and they write it back to Kafka. So we call them loopbacks. So someone else could, um, it could be data aggregation, data enrichments, and so we still prefer to write it back on Kafka. And so we see this right, um, large reading and then writing back onto Kafka, so large bursting patterns that they see when these jobs do go down periodically. Um, that said, normal, like we don't drop any data. We do see this happens. Generally, we don't really have to worry about it. We know the system is designed well to handle this. And so some of the really important maintenance um, use case that we saw. When we were running our Kafka on D2 extra large instances, and originally we, saw, we, we started with a small amount of data, so we didn't really see our maintenance operations taking a lot of time. However, once we reached these terabytes and terabytes of data, multiple customers, and we saw some of the um, brokers had degraded performance or they were going down, in order for us to replace the broker, they had to move all this data to other brokers in order to replace it. So that sometimes would take us 24 hours, if not more, to move that data because Kafka throttles a little bit your um, data offload into other brokers in order to not to interfere with the rest of the, um, sort of give everyone equal um, performance um, on your bro on brokers. However, so we switch into ST1 volumes. Here's what we saw. We could detach our volumes of data, replace our broker, retouch our volumes, and our broker is back in operations in under 30 minutes. It was amazing maintenance-wise, especially when you have to do it in the middle of the night. That's really um, a big use case for us. So some of the, besides our Kafka cluster, some of the instance and volumes um, that we are running, so, as I mentioned, we started Kafka with due to extra large, switched to M4 to extra large with ST1 volumes. Uh, the reason we're running M4 to extra large, Kafka really doesn't use a lot of RAM, um, so we, M4 has been working really well for us and we're still able to achieve the overall throughput of those type of instances. The time series database that we use, the OpenCSDB, so we run two type of nodes there. We, one nodes that really process and store the data and that's where we see M4 to extra large with ST1 volumes. However, we have the, what's called reader nodes. Those are just query our data and return it back to the users, to like Grafana and other applications. And um, in those scenarios, the GP2, the random IO um, type of um, appropriate volumes is what we use there. So our masses cluster, uh, we don't do a lot of disk storage in our masses cluster. It's mainly processing our jobs, like a lot of our Spark jobs are running there, our forwarders are running in masses cluster, other applications that our users are doing to process the data. So since we don't use utilize any disk storage, there is no need for us really to um, have ST1 volumes or other type of um, storage volumes. So GP2 works really well for us. And, I believe the size is rather small there as well. However, the instance size, M4 10 extra large, we started with M4 2 extra large and then we ran into having 50 um, different instances, performed small operations and really had this defragmentation of our resources across instances. We thought, yeah, that's not really good. So we have to go move over to like really large instances so we could have this resource, the full utilization of all the resources that we see. And then they have multiple in-house applications as well as Grafana and Zookeeper. And um, those really don't need a lot of memory. They well scaled them for large works really well for us. We have um, 
GP2 since most of these applications uh, utilize the uh, random IO type of pattern op operations. So I'm gonna pass it back to Daniel for some lessons. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about what we've, uh, what we've done on EBS and why, uh, but we've, we, we've learned some lessons along the way, um, and Paul touched on this a little bit, and the, uh, a big takeaway is that it's, it's really easy to overfocus on I.O., especially because what we're doing is, is building a, uh, a big data system, right? And data is I.O., so uh, disk I.O. Uh, is probably gonna be our bottleneck. Well, as we, as we remove that bottleneck uh, through focus and engineering around it, uh, you can expose other issues, um, and this has been our experience. Um, I, I, I mentioned earlier that we have uh, redundant uh, we have redundant direct connect links connecting to our uh, backbone network. Well, that was not always the case. Uh, we used to have uh, VPN connections over, over the internet, um, and those network connections proved less reliable than the actual storage and would often become themselves a bottleneck. So as we encountered those bottlenecks, we had to work with our networking teams uh, to deploy direct connect connectivity, um, and particularly we operate in US East, so getting that in US East was a big one. Um, and then it also is an issue with the number of simultaneous connections, which I wanted to dive into a little bit more in depth. So uh, we've, we encountered this, uh, this issue in, in production uh, where we started seeing um, a flood of network connections. Our clients kind of make a test connection before they connect to the system to make sure that uh, they're gonna be able to connect. And uh, when there'd be a large scale restart, say somebody doing a software upgrade on a bunch of servers, uh, we would see a flood of those connections. Um, and then the connections would fail, and then they would be retried, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you'd see, eventually you'd see kernel logs saying, uh, the kernel's detecting that this is probably a DDoS attack that's happening. Um, of course, it's, it's not. Um, but we eventually are overloading the ability of Kafka to accept new connections. Um, and this was a, a bottleneck that we didn't really even consider um, when we were first designing the system. Uh, so how do we deal with that? Uh, well, first off, you're seeing a nice graph there. Um, and we had to actually start collecting those metrics on TCP connections because um, we didn't have visibility across the cluster into that when we first, when we first fell into this problem. So we had to uh, collect new metrics on the amount of connections that we have established. Um, and we have them in all different, uh, like, established uh, and the different TCP states that connections can be in. Uh, we had to uh, delve more deeply into understanding how those worked. Um, and probably most importantly, uh, we had to optimize our client code uh, to reduce the amount of connections that it was making. So uh, optimize the actual libraries to reduce the amount of load on the servers more so than just throw up servers. Um, to get us out of this problem specifically, I uh, don't show it here. We actually, uh, to prevent the issue, we started by just throwing a whole bunch of servers at the problem, um, uh, which is fantastic in Amazon when you're <laughs> running into a, a problem, you can do that, and that will get you out of, of an issue for tonight at least. Um, so overall, our results uh, have been really dependable IO performance um, out of EBS. Um, our Kafka cluster doesn't do a whole lot steady states, about seven megabytes per second, uh, but it does that all day, every day. People use the internet 24 seven, so we get metrics about it 24 seven. Um, we've seen really good bursting performance. Um, this graph is from our, uh, from our uh, OpenTSDB cluster, um, and you can see it kind of peaks out at around 125 megabytes per second, uh, which is the limit applied to the instance. So uh, if we, we would need bigger instances to get more disk IO out of that, um, but that's plenty for our, for, our, for our use case. And we've really can seen, seen that we can hit that 100, we can saturate the instance limits um, pretty much on command, uh, which is really fantastic without a lot of really getting exactly what we're offered, what we're uh, promised there. Um, so we've also been able to achieve some uh, cost savings because by moving to EBS, um, we feel comfortable reducing our default replication uh, from three to two. Uh, that's just the default. There are some higher, uh, there are some applications that use a higher availability. Um, so in doing so, the total cost of our system, uh, that is comparing D2 2XLs to the M4 2XLs plus ST1s that we talked about earlier, uh, that increases the total cost of our cluster by about 12%. 
Um, but when you uh, look at it in terms of what's actually usable spa storage space, uh, that decreases our cost of uh, per usable gigabyte by 25%. Um, and this is just pure, straight up, uh, what our AWS bill storage costs are going to be. Uh, it does not account anything for, uh, you know, reduced maintenance costs or faster turnaround, things like that. And of course, uh, a big advantage was decoupling the instances from the storage. Um, I mentioned earlier that we were able to experiment with different instance types uh, without having to do an extensive data moving process. Uh, we're able to um, replace data quickly. Uh, before, it would take a minimum of eight hours of data to replicate everything off of the, 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 the node. Um, and now it takes 20, 30 minutes uh, to detach, redeploy, um, and attach, um, which for us has been just, uh, it's, it's just great uh, to be able to, well, you have a poor performing instance, just replace it and uh, move on with your life. And I think I'm going to pass it back to Paul uh, to wrap up for us. Okay. Um, so... Uh, a few things you can look dive more into. I mentioned earlier there are a number of sessions uh, that were available for uh, NoSQL particular, in particular. Um, there's a whole bunch of EBS sessions and storage sessions this week. If you really want to dive more into different aspects of uh, the storage components and our services, by all means, uh, you can explore some of those. Also, we have a Kafka Confluent Quick Start. So if you want to spin up a Kafka cluster that's pretty much uh, you, uh, you go to the quick start and you just click a few buttons and select a few things, it builds a VPC for you, it deploys everything for you. You can actually do this and try it out yourself if you want to end up deploying your own, your cluster um, with uh, uh, Confluent and uh, Kafka. So, um, and then uh, let's see, I think there's one, nope, we're missing a slide here, but it's okay. So that's all we have for this. Um, just want to reiter reiterate that there are so many advantages of using EBS for your storage, and just pay attention to the I.O. patterns of your workloads, and you can then choose the right storage for those. As you see, um, there are many use cases for using ST1, SC1 volumes compared to the SSD, the GP2s, um, but GP2s are still a great general purpose uh, storage. So if you don't really don't care, that's probably your first choice to try out, and then go from there. So uh, I want to thank uh, Daniel and Anna for joining us today and really hearing their story. So, Thank you, everybody.